Welcome back. What you're looking at right here in the desk is what's called a three by three by three LED cube. And what it does is make little animations, as you can see, and it kind of has like a 3D effect to it. And I mentioned during a recent mailbag video that I had recently purchased a eight by eight by eight kit, which of course is a much larger build, more complicated and a lot more soldering involved. And this is going to be part one of possibly a four part series showing the build. This particular video you're watching now is going to be more of a brief explanation of what this thing is, how it works, and we're gonna go over the parts, we're gonna go over maybe the eBay listing, how much this thing costs, and just basic stuff like that. The actual build part will not actually be in this video. Um, the second video will be the building of the controller circuit, which is the bottom half here. The third video will be the LED matrix, which is this part up here. And the possible fourth video will probably just be, you know, the actual thing in operation, more or less. And I've decided to do it this way because this is going to take a monumental amount of time to build. Um, this is by far the most complicated kit I've ever produced myself. Um, as far as it, putting it together and whatnot. It wasn't a lot of money, but if you buy them completed, they can be quite a bit of money. So very first thing we'll talk about is what we're looking at here. Now, as mentioned, this is a three by three by three kit. This is uh, actually a shield for Arduino. Now I've mentioned many a time before what a shield is. It's basically just a little device with some pins on it and a plug directly into the Arduino, which is under here and you can kind of see it a little bit. I'll pull this apart in a little bit and show you all that. And we can plug this into a computer using a USB connection here. We can program this to do a variety of things. Now this particular kit came from Radio Shack originally and so did the coding, everything else. However, I've recently uploaded newer coding of this that I found online in the wonderful community of the World Wide Web that allowed it to have more patterns. And I don't want to really get into programming and all that stuff on here. Um, but I will do the rudimentary basics of how this thing actually works. So as I mentioned, this is an Arduino. It is a microcontroller. Um, you can see through these little solder connections, these are the tops of the pins that go into this header here. Here's the bottom side of it. And each of these pins, uh, some provide power, some are inputs, some are outputs. Um, some go either way, depending on how you program it. And to get this to work, you need uh, one connection basically one point for each of the negatives and one for each of the positives and it's hooked up in an array so if you actually take a close look at this you could see this solder connection here actually runs up and connects all three of these LEDs and that would be on the positive sides of things if I remember correctly and then these three over here are on the negative sides of things so there's three six nine twelve connections to the Arduino and um, numbers wise I don't remember off the top of my head how many connections they actually are on the Arduino but this is pretty much as far as you can get without any additional circuits. Now the interesting thing about how this works is this is doing something called multiplexing. Right now you're seeing all the LEDs kind of flashing like that they're not all flashing at the same time. They're actually uh, briefly coming on and then shutting off, the next one's coming on and shutting off, and it's doing it so quickly to the human eye, it seems like they're all coming on at the same time. They're not, there's not enough outputs for this to do that. Now what I'm gonna do here is actually disconnect this and I'm gonna pull this shield right off the top of here just so we can just get a quick peek inside here. This is, like I said, the Arduino. What you're looking at is a microcontroller, the headers for the ins and outs, a USB connection with the subsequent parts to make that work, and a DC input. Very simple, this one just happens to be in an acrylic case with some feet in the bottom of it, and the shield just plugs in the top. And you can see here's the headers. Now, building this was pretty easy because what they did was is they gave you a little template so you can see these holes right here, these LEDs actually fit into upside down and you use them to solder them together into uh, a grid. And then once you're done with the top grid and the next one, the next one, as separate pieces, you solder them on top of each other. So as mentioned, they're all connected to each other. Um, what I'll actually do is I'll pull in my multimeter here and we can actually see this has a diode test, diode and continuity. So if I put this down to that, 
and we take the leads, normally continuity, you get a beep. However, since this is loose, we can show you, if we actually use this and connect the leads here, and this is how we can test for polarity. You can see these outer three are the negatives and all the ones in here are positive. And if I put the connections here, we can see the topmost LED lights up. It is a bit faint, but it is lighting up. If I move this over to the next one, you can see the LED below it lights. And then if I move it over here, the bottom one lights. And that's how I mentioned how it's doing multiplexing. It's switching these outputs very quickly back and forth to enable the different pins. And as you can imagine, if I hold it onto this first one here and I go backwards, it'll light up in the subsequent row. So there's the one closest to the camera, here's the middle one, here's the one furthest from the camera. And if I move it over, we can get the back ones to light up and so on and so forth. So this whole time, it's just taking these and just kind of circulating through the different ins and outs to make them all kind of light up. And if I just insert that again in here really quickly and plug it in, once the Arduino boots up, it goes right into its standard routine. Very simple. If you can find these things and you want to start playing along with it, I would I suggest getting one. They're super easy to, to work with. The Arduino is just a board on its own. You don't have to do anything at all with it except maybe install the driver in your computer and the IDE uh, program which allows you to program this. Maybe learn a little code, but honestly once you get the actual package for this, you just upload it to it. I mean, simple. And uh, you just have to solder together the shield and plug it in and you have yourself a little mini LED cube. But as mentioned, this isn't about a 3x3x3 three by three by three cube. It's about an 8x8x8 by eight by eight cube. And by the way, 3x3x3, three by three by three. top row 369, 9 times 3 Not a whole lot of LEDs, it is, but it's not. 8x8x8, eight by eight by eight, that's 512 LEDs. So it's definitely a lot bigger of a project to build, no doubt. Um, but it's going to be a lot cooler when it's done for sure. And uh, I may have mentioned in the mailbag video, I didn't mention it yet. This is actually getting built for a friend of mine for his new apartment. And uh, I bought this off a Chinese seller on eBay for like $17 and change, which for as many parts as you're getting here is actually a steal in my book. But as you can see, there is a gigantic bag of LEDs. There may be actually more than 512 in here, I'm not entirely sure, but if I just uh, bring some of these out here, they're all kind of like birds nested together. That's a lot of LEDs. Um, <laughs> I don't have, I, I don't think I've ever had 500 and something LEDs. Um, here's a little LED tester. I'll just plug these in here, positives on top. Positive on these is the longer lead of the two. And you can see how it lights up. Now these are diffused. So even though you do get a point of light out of it, uh, it does kind of emit light everywhere. And I don't have any of the, well actually I do. I have a cl uh, clear LED here, so you can get an idea of the comparison. It's literally like crystal clear. And then here's the frosted one. I do recommend if you get these to get frosted LEDs, because that way they can be seen from, from any angle, and that's kind of the idea. Um, now, since I mentioned the other episodes, I'll, I'll talk about that. So obviously we're talking about all the parts and everything here in the grand scheme of things. When we go to do the array, we'll actually have to make a template just like they're using here out of wood. And it, it's just, you need to do this because there's so much soldering involved. It, you, have to, you have to do it. So that'll definitely be a subject for um, part three of this video. Um, but we'll keep talking about the parts here. I'm just gonna slowly push that out the way. And, you know, hopefully we don't lose any of those. Uh, hopefully there is extra. And here is that board, the main board. And you can kind of get an idea from the scale of this thing to exactly how much soldering is involved. And you should know by now, if you've watched this channel enough, I do like to solder. It, I find it quite therapeutic uh, as, long as, it, as long as it goes well. Um, now, I'm doing this particular video not just for my viewers, not just for my own personal entertainment, not just to catalog what's going on here, but this does not come with instructions. And the listing does not have instructions. 
and other listings also do not have instructions. And uh, I did some poking around. I did find some other people who are doing exactly what I'm doing. Some of these videos are very short. Some of them are piece by piece. You know, this is my spin on it, basically. So I've taken little bits and blurbs of pretty much everything that I've looked at for these things and put it into my own video. Uh, quickly, I'll, I'm gonna pull in just another little quick thing I did. This is a uh, clock build I actually did in a recent video. It has the same kind of blue board inside and I actually like these blue circuit boards. They actually look really cool. Now, uh, I did start kind of reverse engineering this a little bit and it's not as complicated as it looks really. Um, in order to get the right amount of outputs for this to work, they're using what's called shift registers and there's also a Darlington driver here. I'm not an electronics engineer, I just know what I learned from other sources. That's pretty much all I am. And uh, I'm a tinkerer, just like most of my, my viewers are. Um, but this big section here, this is where the microcontroller is going to sit. But while this is uh, a quite a big microcontroller, much bigger than the Arduino that we're using in the little build, um, this particular unit here still doesn't have enough inputs and outputs to power such a large thing. So you need all these shift registers. So if you want to just conceptualize this, this big chip is basically outputting to these smaller chips and these are what's controlling the LEDs, at least one leg of them. And then the other one over here is controlling the other leg. This is the Darlington um, chipset, we'll call it. This is controlling the negatives. These are controlling all the positives. So on this side over here, there's uh, eight connections going into this. And then each one of these is also getting eight connections because of how many uh, LEDs are here, or maybe even more actually. Um, there's, there are quite a bit of these here. You figure there's four, eight layers. Um, yeah, I, have to, I haven't really done the math of how many outputs are actually being translated into these, but this is all multiplexing. This is, this is telling this one to turn on, like pin one, pin two, pin three, pin four, like all in sequence, and then it's going to the next one in sequence, next one in sequence, so on and so forth, like at a blazing speed, like megahertz, like it's going really fast. And to the naked eye, it looks like they're just on steadily. So we should get some pretty smooth animation out of this. The rest of this stuff's ancillary. Um, there's a little crystal down here and the uh, required uh, capacitors to make that work. Uh, other side of the board, you have a DC jack, a switch, a couple capacitors, a couple resistors, a power LED. Uh, there's actually two spots here for buttons. And on an Arduino, normally you have a reset button, which is unfortunately under the shield. You can't really access it. Uh, they don't give you these buttons. Uh, definitely one's reset. The other one may be to uh, go between the different patterns. I'm not sure. I haven't really played with it, obviously, because it's not even put together yet. Uh, but I haven't found anybody who actually put those in here to get this to do anything. Uh, there's also even a little spot here that's possibly used as a programming header. So I'm, I believe you should be able to hook this up uh, through, I'm not sure if it's gonna be USB, it may be serial connection, like one of those, um, I forget what they're called now, but it's basically what's in here that's converting it to USB. You can get one of those little chips and just hook it to here, I think. I'm not 100% sure. I know it comes pre-programmed, so I'm not too concerned about reprogramming this thing. But this board has to be built in sequences, and we'll get into that in the next video. But what's nice is they give everything kind of like, it's, it's already uh, kind of laid out here where it's going. And if I get close enough here, and hopefully the camera will zoom in, we got the component values, not what belongs there though. So I can tell you, hey, this is where R5 goes, but I don't know which resistor R5 is. So we have to kind of process of elimination, although it should not be hard to do because as we look at the rest of the parts here, there are only so many pieces and they only go in so many positions. Of course, they give you a USB connection, but this is of course just to get power. This is your standard 5.5 uh, millimeter exterior, 2.5 millimeter interior here to a five volt connection. Um, I saw somewhere online how much current this thing draws. It's not substantial, but it's you know a couple amps, maybe two, three amps if I believe. So you might have to use a power supply to power this. It may not necessarily run off your computer's USB connection depending on what kind of 
connection you have there. Uh, another thing about this kit I do like, it came with this little plastic kit of uh, parts here, which is which is pretty nice. I noticed some of these Chinese kits that do have a lot of pieces and are, are of pretty good quality do have these. Uh, I did separate these a little bit differently. They kind of had it all like laid out, but I put all of the shift register ICs in here. These are all the IC sockets. There is actually one extra socket and one extra shift register. This is the Darlington driver over here. This is our big beefy microprocessor or microcontroller, I should say. Um, there's a socket for that. There's a few resistors in here. I'll pull all this out in just a moment. Uh, one thing we do have to do are take these headers here and break them up into individual little pieces. And I've actually seen somebody remove the little plastic piece on here. Not sure if it's 100% necessary. Um, it looked better without it, given what he did with it. So we'll have to explore that. Uh, this is actually kind of brilliant. Uh, on this particular build here, they soldered directly into the board. What they did in this particular situation was is they took these headers and they soldered them in instead. And that's what these little white circles are for. So every one of these is going to get populated with one of those headers. And if you look at this, here's those, the, uh, the, the ground connections. There's some of these are rows and some of these are columns. So I guess well, if you look at it, there is rows and columns and there's also layers. So we'll call these the layer connectors. Rows and columns are obviously, you know, through here. So the layer, layer one, layer two, layer three, layer one, layer two, layer three. Pretty simple. So here's your eight layers out here on the outer side. And like I said, those are going directly to the Darlington uh, driver. The rest of these are all going to the shift registers. Um, not a bad build. It's just, it's going to be very time consuming. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at the rest of the parts here. I'll get them all pulled out. All right, starting with the empty case, it's, ju it's just a plastic case, nothing special, but it is nice because it comes with the removable little dividers and it actually does come with a bunch of extra dividers. So um, thumbs up for that, definitely a nice thing. We're actually gonna utilize this for this build because once you start breaking up all 40 of these little headers, you get a lot of little pieces all over the place. So we'll definitely use it to organize it. Uh, next little bits of plastic that we have here are the little rubber feet. Um, pretty self-explanatory what those things will do for us. Of course, we have all of these, uh, I think these are 20 pin. Yeah, actually, the camera's probably not going to pick it up, but there is a little 20 engraved in here. These are the 20 pin IC sockets. Definitely a few of those for sure. Um, we have here the... Uh, shift register. This is a five. I'm sorry, an SN74HC573AN from Texas Instrument. You get uh, eight of those. Um, of course, we have the Darlington shift, uh, uh, the Darlington driver over here. This is a Toshiba ULN2803APG, and I'll put links to in the description to the data sheets if you care to look at all these. This is a series resistor or a resistor array. There's actually eight resistors in here and the ninth pins the common ground and I believe this is a 10,000 so there's a 103 and I believe it's one zero with three zeros behind it so that'd be 10,000 so that's a 10k series uh, resistor. Like I showed you the big socket for the, uh, for the uh, actual controller. This is a 40 pin socket. A couple of resistors Actually, there's two of these smaller value resistors and then these guys here. Um, I don't have the color codes memorized, but if I go over to my list of parts over here that I kind of wrote up uh, somewhere along the lines here, these are 510 ohm resistors and the other ones are 4.7 kilo ohm resistors. That's these two guys here. Uh, there's a couple capacitors here. These are electrolytics. Uh, they're 10 microfarad, 25 volt. And then there should be the 22 picofarad. There's one here and somewhere is the other one. And those are the, uh, as mentioned for the crystal. Now the crystal here says 12.000. And that is a 12 megahertz crystal oscillator. And that's pretty much it. Little, little power switch, nothing to write home about. Little DC jack, same thing with that. Nothing to write home about, nothing special. 
And that's fundamentally it. And there's not a lot of parts, but just a lot of pins to solder. Now, as mentioned, since you know, a lot of this is trial and error, uh, I did try to re-engineer this myself, trace everything out. I used a multimeter on continuity mode to try to pin some certain things up before I actually looked online. It was more fun that way. I got to learn something, and then once I found someone else's video or found a blog about it or anything else I found, I was able to confirm my findings. And um, well, like I said, I'm not an electronics engineer, but I feel pretty proud of myself that I was able to do that. And here's what I basically did. So this is the parts list, and as I took these out, I kind of wrote down where they belong. So for example, the eight shift registers uh, are U1 through U8. The uh, Darlington sync driver is U9. The MCU is U10, so on, so on, so on. So this is all gonna be down in the description. Hopefully this will make it easier for somebody else to do this build. Um, there is instructables on these things. Um, I may even be able to put this into like a, a PDF file or somewhere to put it on like a Google Doc or who knows. Um, but I mentioned here, what does J3 do? And do I use the leftover terminals here for J3 if I want to program it? And what does S2, uh, uh, S2 and S3 do? And those are the buttons and where are the parts? Why, why didn't they give you those? It's like I said, it may not be necessary. Uh, and then I kind of came up with a little bit of a block diagram. This isn't perfect, you know, by any means. It's definitely not pin for pin or anything like that. But I try to show like, yep, yeah, okay, the two caps and the crystal oscillator gets hooked up to the chip. This is an Atmel chip, more or less. I mean, it's pretty much the same kind of thing. I mean, it's not Atmel branded, but it's pretty much the same concept. Um, the little uh, uh, resistor array connects directly to that. The um, Darlington driver connects to that, and the resistors also connect to that. So all the cathodes, all the negatives of the LEDs, one through eight, get hooked up directly that way. And then all the positives get hooked up through this giant network. So as mentioned, now I, I drew one data line coming out here. It may be more than one data line, but this is just for simplicity. But I did draw out, you can see all eight. So layer one, layer two, the whole way down. So you can kind of hopefully get a scope of how big this is going to be. Um, and see, I think I have something else written up on here. Yeah, so um, the LED array, and we'll get into this in the third video, but you know, the LED array is just, they're all connecting uh, all the positives, or I should say in this particular drawing, all the negatives are connecting out this way. So we have a, a row of all the negatives here, individually one through eight, and then we have uh, all the columns over here, one through eight with all the positives. And if we put the multimeter to it, we'd be able to test this LED individually. And then just by moving this throughout the line, we could test each individual LED in the series. And we'll have to do that, of course, once we actually go to test the circuit out. Uh, and then I just, just starting up, writing up some building steps and we'll, we'll get into all that piece by piece as we get into it. So I, I wanna get started with this now, actually. Um, judging by the time, I'm probably not gonna get uh, two episodes done. I was intending to get the intro and the board built tonight and edited and uploaded, but probably not gonna happen. This is gonna be one of those intro videos and I'll just start building it over the weekend. So, uh, you know, Thursday will be, it's probably Thursday today when you're watching this video and the next one will be on Tuesday. So it gives me plenty of time to put this together. But I do wanna go ahead and pay some attention to these guys, get them all split up. We'll uh, obviously remove the little tape from the LEDs. Not that it's necessary, but you know, it just gets it out of the way. And uh, we'll bring back in that little parts bin over here and um, we'll just reorganize this a little bit. They didn't have any of the dividers up in the top because these are quite long, so it took up a lot of space, but we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Now, really quickly, we're gonna need a pair of these just basic small pliers and we're gonna hold down on one of these and if we rock it both ways like this, you can see it snaps right off. So I already did one of those already, and here it is. So there's uh, one there, there's one there. I'm gonna go ahead now, cut the film, and break all of these up. So that should be just about a moment. And I got everything put together here, as you can see. All these are completely separated from each other. Uh, I managed to put all the IC chips kind of together in these two components uh, drawers here. This is all the actual uh, shift registers. 
and this is the Darlington driver with the uh, subsequent socket for that. The rest of the hardware pieces up here in these two, and then the longer pieces like the resistors, I just kept them together in there for now. So going to these pieces here, um, we get a close up look at it. You can see it's just now, it's just a little terminal with a little peg at the end of it and this little uh, piece of plastic. Now, they use these as, as headers, um, but this is what they call a machined header. You can see it's rounded out. It's actually got a little tiny spring inside there. Uh, I don't unfortunately have any I can show you loose, but on the Arduino, uh, these are square pin headers. And it's the same concept, except these tend to have a little bit of a better fit to them. Uh, in fact, if I place two of them together, uh, they, they spring together nicely. So these are going to hold the LEDs uh, to get at the end nice. Um, we may solder them, uh, the actual LED, into this um, possibly. Um, we may leave it removable. I'll have to see how the, the whole assembly goes. But now the thing is, is figuring out whether I want to leave that little black piece of plastic on or not. And I'll just bring this into frame real quick here and show you when we sit that in there, there is actually just a little bit of that silver sitting out at the bottom here. So that black doesn't sit flush with the board. So that's the one reason why I would take it off. And as you can see, it, it comes out the bottom. Now, uh, normally components like these through hole ones are soldered from the back side here. Um, but what I did notice a lot of people did with these builds is they actually soldered it in from the top because the pad is still accessed or accessible, I should say, as you can see from right here. And that way they got this to kind of float within the solder and sit upright. So that's gonna be the thing. I mean, I originally thought maybe we can put them in and kind of lay them, but this can kind of go either way around here if you can see it wobbles. And um, hopefully, hopefully I can zoom in on that and show you what's happening. But um, as that wobbles back and forth, it's not gonna sit in there straight, see? It's going to weeble wobble. So I don't have any real way of sitting it upright other than soldering it in from the front as mentioned. Also, you may notice a lot of these uh, are sitting in between, like these up here are not, but these here are. They're sitting in between the drivers. So if you flip this over, uh, once you put this socket in, you can't access that. Not that you need to, but you got to keep that in mind that you put this in the right order. So I'm pretty much sure the first thing we're going to solder into this board are going to be all those little connectors. Um, once I figure out if I actually want to take that black piece off. Now, since most of the time it seems like that's what they're doing, I'm probably going to lean towards that. Uh, there is a couple ways of doing this. You can actually possibly slip it out from the back, although that didn't seem as easy. The other thing you could do is using a pair of cutters, just gently cut the plastic and not hard where you're gonna go straight through the metal. But if we can do that, we should be able to get these all out. I did try actually using a pair of pliers on the back and then one in the front, maybe pull it off that way. I was gonna do that to the whole strip and just pull them out but that didn't prove to be very easy and I don't want to break the pins on this because, well, I only have so many of those things and uh, I don't want to mess them up. So I'll have to come up with some kind of an easy way to get these off. Um, the other thing I thought about not taking them off is once you actually apply heat to this, that's definitely going to break that bond, if you will. That metal is going to heat up and it's going to melt the plastic that surrounds it just enough where that's going to slide on and off. That may be a good thing. That may make it easier to remove. Um, that also make it might make it very sloppy in the end result. So I think taking them off is going to be the way to do it. And I think the way to do that is going to be holding them like this in a pair of pliers and maybe using a pair of side cutters like this. After I, after I drop it on my lap, luckily not the floor, but perhaps we can go like this and uh, lever it off. Of course, I didn't actually practice this yet to see if this is gonna be the way to do it. Um, yeah, I, I need to get a different tool. One moment, please. Yeah, so I figured I'd grab a set of these uh, bill cutters over here, as I, as I call them, and uh, maybe we could come in from this way like, like this and lift it off but that didn't work what ended up happening was is i just 
took these cutters like this and just kind of squeezed just slightly and it, that plastic just snaps right off. So this is what it looks like in the naked raw. And uh, once we just slot that in real quick here, that's definitely a lot better looking. All right, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and break all of those. Now these cutters are definitely the way to do this. Um, all I'm doing is just taking one of these pieces like this and I'm just sitting inside here, cupping it in my hand and just squeezing it and it just comes right apart. Very, very simple. Uh, I was debating as I'm doing this, was this easier to do individually like this or was it easier to do it as a strip? I'm not sure. Um, I'm thinking if you had them in a strip, you can just kind of nip one as, at, uh, at the end and just keep going your way through the strip. Um, but I'm not sure if they'll break apart that easily because what we're effectively doing here is when you take them off of the strip You're removing all the surrounding plastic from it from the uh, rest of the strip So if I just pinch this like this, it's going to go straight through it because there's no other plastic to get in the way whereas if it was still in the strip uh, if you're going in, you know, if the strips this way and you're going in the end over here and you're trying to snip off that last piece um, it may not shear off correctly. Like you're, you're it, it'll break midway off and the, the little metal piece will fall out, but you still have that piece of plastic that you have to get past to get to the next one. And at that point it'll fall off, but I don't know, maybe it's six and one half a dozen the other. Maybe it would take more time this way than it would the other way. What do you think? Leave uh, a comment below in the section and, and think uh, about, do you think it'd be easier to do it as a strip or do you think it'd be easier to do it individually? And there we have it. I've completely separated all the pieces. Actually, there was a rogue one hiding here in a pile of the useless plastic pieces. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a little rough on the hand from from holding this thing. It's it's very precise, and just sitting here pinching this forty times. Uh, Tend to wear the hand out a little bit. Uh, there are some things I failed to mention. Uh, it did come with a little piece of wire here, and this is what you're going to use to actually connect the cathode end over here to the various layers. Um, they use this thin wire. I'm not sure if this is going to do it, honestly. I, I might use just a little bit of a heavier cable. Um, there's not a lot of current going through this at any one time, but I just it seems a bit of anemic, this cable. So we may use something a little larger. Uh, I do understand they use the small one here to kind of make it less visible. Um, and I have also seen people paint this wire with a Sharpie, that's like, it's like a silver Sharpie, to try to make it blend in with the metallic colored components a little bit better. Um, we'll see once we get to that stage what we're gonna do with it. But for now, we have all these little loose connectors here and uh, the other thing I failed to mention is this surface we're working on is an anti-static mat and I'm also in bare feet. Um, my house tends to generate a fair amount of static electricity during the winter time especially and I want to mitigate that so of course the mats in place so when we work with our ICs in here we're not actually shocking them out. Uh, and another thing I will mention now and I'll mention again in the subsequent episodes is at some point these LEDs are going to have to get tested. Um, and I've toyed around with the idea of using the LED tester and individually testing one at a time or putting bunches in here at a time and just seeing if they all light up. Um, but the quick and easy way to do this is, is once we actually solder this into the array, we'll use our multimeter as we did before and we'll test out the rows and columns that way to make sure they all light up. Um, so we'll have to test the 512 individual LEDs in that, re in that way. And of course, of course, we'll want to do that because you don't want to put this thing all together and find out, you know, half of your LEDs are dead. And that also make sure we have them all oriented in the right, kind of right connection and stuff. Well, with that, I don't really have much more to add to this particular episode uh, and this particular part of the series. So I'm going to say thanks for watching. If you're not already a subscriber, you can click up here to subscribe. I'll put two videos over here in the corner you can check out. One of these is gonna be either like my most popular video or recent video or one that YouTube suggests. The other one will be part two of this. Uh, there may not be anything right here initially. At some point there will be, of course, because the episode will exist. Uh, don't forget to give it either a thumbs up or a thumbs down and we'll see you next video.